Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie One Night in the Tropics from 1940. The studio is Universal Pictures. The release date was November 15, 1940. The running time, 82 minutes, and it was in black and white. Leonard Maltin from his classic movie guy gives it two and a half out of four stars. He writes, Ambitious but unmemorable musical with songs by Jerome Kerr, Oscar Hammerstein, and Dorothy Fields. From the gimmicky story Love Insurance, which was filmed previously in 1919 and 1924. It's also Aaron Costello's film debut, though they have secondary roles to Alan Jones, Nancy Kelly, and Robert Cummings and their love triangle. But Aaron and Costello do get a portion of their Who's On First routine in the mix. Now, Malton was spot on in his brief review as the only reason, including myself, that anyone would watch this film after its initial release is because of Abner Costello being on screen. The movie is harmless enough, but Abner Costello are the main draw for me and most people. And the reason I own this film and many of their not-so-great films is because I have a box set which includes all of their Universal films. Now, I've covered the early portion of Abner Costello's career in their Abner Costello Meet Frankenstein episode, so I'll briefly go over the characters now, but go back and listen to that episode if you haven't heard it already. So you have Robert Cummings, who ended up being the best-known actor from this film, apart from Abner Costello. And by this point in 1940, Cummings was mostly known for B-pictures that he appeared in through the mid-1930s. He started to get more leading man-type comedic roles when he signed to Universal Pictures in 1938, appearing in a few movies with the popular actress Deanna Durbin. Cummings' career would pick up after One Night in the Tropics, including a few movies that I do own in my collection, like The Devil and Miss Jones. No, not that one. (laughs) This one with Gene Arthur and an early Hitchcock film called Saboteur. Alan Jones was best known for his work in musicals on films, most notably the original Showboat in 1936 and The Firefly. And that for non-musicals, he was in two well-regarded Marx Brothers films, A Night at the Opera and A Day at the Races, as he became the straight man of the group after Zeppo Marx left. And if you didn't know, those are also the names of the band named Queen and their 70s albums. Nancy Kelly started as a child performer working on radio. She starred in 27 films in the 1930s and 40s, with her best known being Jesse James with Tyrone Power, Henry Fonda, and Randolph Scott. She also starred in The Bad Seed in 1956 and earned an Oscar nomination for Best Actress for her role in The Bad Seed. Okay, let's get into the making of the film. So as I mentioned, this is the film debut for Abner Costello after years of them being on the vaudeville and radio circuit. Universal Studios believed that Abner Costello could make them a fortune, and they did. Now, One Night in the Tropics was originally titled Riviera, but then it was changed when the location was adjusted to South America. It was also planned as a musical for actress Danielle Dario in 1937, but it was never made. So the movie premiere was held in Lou Costello's hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, and even featured a parade. However, the film itself was not well received by critics, but the performances by Abbott and Costello were praised, and the reviews often stated that it was them that saved the film from being completely worthless. After the glowing reviews about the duo came in, Universal Studios signed them up for two more films and an option for a third. Also, the duo was allowed to keep 10% of the film profits, which was unheard of at the time. And Abbott and Costello would make 28 films in total at Universal. Okay, let's get into the film. So it begins with two friends, Jim Lucky Moore, played by Alan Jones, and Steve Harper, played by Robert Cummings. And they're walking down the street in tuxedos. Steve is running into everyone that passes by, and he's almost in a trance because he's in love with his fiancée, Cynthia, played by Nancy Kelly. However, Lucky is more pessimistic about love and marriage, and the two decide to ask random couples on the street if they're happily married. The first couple they encounter are indeed happily married. However, not to each other, if you know what I mean. (laughs) The next couple has a less amusing outcome, as Lucky asks if they are happily married, and then asks if the man chased women before he was married. The man, indignant, takes a swing at Lucky. Lucky ducks, and the punch lands on Steve. Lucky then punches out the man, and before you know it, he's being tackled by the cops. But Steve gets away. While in his haste to run away from the melee, Steve knocks over an older woman carrying a dog. 
She hopes that she never has to run into Steve again, but as it turns out, they're both going to the same building. And then the elevator gets stuck, and Steve hops out, leaving the woman stranded. So Steve arrives at his fiance Cynthia's apartment, and she's trying on her wedding dress. And then they get a surprise visitor at the door. You can probably guess who. Oh, say, darling, by the way, what happened to Lucky? Who? Lucky, you know, the best man. Oh, well, he got delayed a little. Oh, I see. Where's your aunt? Well, she went for a drive, but she'll be right back. Oh, there she is. Now, darling, go and open the door for her, will you? Oh, make a hit with her. <laughs> oh, you will. She'll love you. Oh! Cynthia! Oh, Cynthia! Oh, I'm kidding. What's the matter? That. That man. Oh, yes, yes. That's Steve you've been wanting to meet, and this is my Aunt Kitty. Hmm. Well, uh, what's the matter with everybody? Is that the man you're going to marry? Oh, yes. Well, what are you staring at? Has he got two heads? He knocked me down the street. He broke the elevator. He abandoned me between floors. And he was born on May the 12th. Is that your idea of making a good impression? Oh, I don't feel well. Ah, 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 Chi-Chi. Now he's sitting on Chi-Chi. Dog murderer. I didn't even see the mutt. Incidentally, why don't you run around with something your own size? Uh, Cynthia, get my things. I can't stay in this house another moment. Oh, now, Aunt Kitty, don't get yourself in a snit. Yeah. Steve will go. Couldn't we perhaps be a little more reasonable about this? It's just a silly accident after all. <laughs> Cynthia, get that man out of this house this minute. Uh, come on, that man, and exit is indicated. I've never seen anybody make a more interesting impression. Well, it is what I feel. Oh, Cynthia. What's the matter with her? Oh, nothing, darling. She's just getting on. But you know, when a woman reaches 40... Well, 40? I'll bet you 50 she'll never see 60 again. Is that so? Never attempt to see or communicate with my niece again. The marriage is off. Definitely off. Oh, Aunt Kitty, he Aunt didn't Kitty, I didn't... Have... Oh! Oh, Cynthia. It, it, it's off. You bet your life it's off. Definitely off. In the meantime, Lucky is being arraigned by a judge for the street brawl he started. However, Jim didn't get the name Lucky for nothing. Striking an officer, eh? Oh, I assure you, Your Honor, it was an accident. Does that look like an accident? Disgraceful. How do you plead? Oh, guilty, of course. Of course? Do you realize you're in for a fine and a large one? Oh, you can make it as large as you like. It won't come out of my pocket. It'll come out of somebody's. Certainly. The insurance companies. Hmm. Queer kind of insurance. Mm, not at all. My company will insure anything from teapots to televisions. Hey, what about the charge here? Quiet. I bet there's one thing you've never insured. Bet you my finer, is it? What about the black eye? Oh, that. I'm running for Superior Court in the coming elections. Could you, um, come about the risk of uh, re-election? Confidentially. What are your chances? Confidentially. I'm a cinch. Fine. I'll insure you for twice your salary. Just a little matter of putting your autograph on the undotted line, right there. I never did see such goings on. Is this a court or a bargain counter? All right. Well, thanks very much for dropping in. Oh, not at all. You can mail me the check tomorrow. Congratulations. See you in Superior Court. <laughs> hey, Judge McCracken, do you realize what you've done? You let him go without a fine. <clears throat> Sentence suspended. What's your occupation? Politician. 90 days. The next day, a distraught Steve is attempting to write an apology letter to Cynthia. Then Lucky shows up and comes up with a brilliant plan for Steve. My, my darling Cynthia, I could not sleep a wink last night because of my unfortunate behavior. My lovely Cynthia, due to a series of unhappy coincidence. Now that's just it. My dearest girl, is it my fault that you have a loony ant? Sounds bad. Say, what'd she feed you last night? Ant poison. Oh, Aunt Kitty, eh? Well, how'd you do? I didn't do, I went. Oh, I did all right. Like, that reminds me, don't forget to vote for a judge named McCracken. Oh, will you shut up? My marriage is practically on the rock. Oh, if I could only be sure. To be sure? Insure. Oh, I'm not interested in your screwy policies. That's wonderful. Well, that's marvelous. Well, why didn't I think of that before? 
Think of what? Love insurance, love insurance. Oh, now I know you're crazy. Now, look, do you want to be sure you'll marry Cynthia? Well, what do you think I'm yapping about? All right, take out a policy, love insurance. I don't get it. Look, you'd be willing to lay 10 to 1 on a horse, would you? Oh, look, a policy is no bet, and Cynthia is not a horse. But this policy would be a bet. I'm willing to lay a 10 to 1 on your marriage. If you marry Cynthia, you lose the bet and the premium. Well, if I don't marry Cynthia, no amount of money in the world will ever make up for her loss. I promise you, you'll get the girl, not the money. Look, have I ever lost a bet before? Did I ever have to pay off on a policy? Say, that's right. You never did, did you? No. You've always been lucky, lucky. Yes. Give me something to sign. I want to make it legal. All right. Well, that's wonderful. Lucky. Wonderful. Is Mr. Steve Harper in? Yes, there's a gentleman with him at the moment. Well, there'll be a lady with him before you can say your hootie. Ouch. Well, gotta get back to the office. Oh, I hate to let you go, Lucky. You make me feel so, so lucky. Why not? You're practically a married man. But incidentally, I think that's your phone ringing. It might be Cynthia. Cynthia! That was my ears ringing. Insured. Hello? Oh, Cynthia. Oh, that's sweet of you, Steve. But after all, you know, this isn't Mother's Day. Darling, if you send any more flowers, we'll have to move out. Oh, that's all right. You're welcome. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Mr. Harper is out. Well, I'll just come in and wait. I'm sorry. I cannot allow you to come in. But please, Miss Fitzgerald. Oh, darling, you want to play. Ow! Ooh. You're just more than welcome. <laughs> oh, I can hardly wait until this evening. Is that so? Oh, hello, Mickey. Only in the big moment? Oh, oh, no, no, not at all. I'm just, uh, just talking to my laundry. Oh, well, don't let me interrupt. Uh, hello. Now, wait a minute, darling. I I've got Aunt Kitty all soothed and ready to talk to you. Now, just a minute. Aunt Kitty! Uh, hello. I guess that'll, that'll be all for today. That'll take care of... <laughs> Look. No, Aunt Kitty is perfectly reconciled to our being married, and she'll soon love you just as much as I do. No, no pl please. <laughs> well, I, I don't think that uh, today I'll have time to go over the list with you. Well, look, this, this thing can't, this, this thing can't go on forever, you know. Every, everything I've been setting out hasn't been coming back. Yep, yeah, look. Uh, fully five pairs of socks are missing. Uh, a dozen handkerchiefs, three towels. Five, three, twelve. What are you counting for? The man you're engaged to is a May 12th lunatic and a dangerous one at that. Scum! Hello? Hello? Sort of hung up. Funny people, those laundries. She has a very pretty voice, your laundry. <laughs> yes, she has. How do you know? A man who leads a double life shouldn't have two telephones. Mickey, I got a lot of things to do today. Listen, I'm not leading a double life anymore. Well, I mean, it's double only in the sense that from Saturday on, I won't be single. I'll be double. I mean, I'm going to get married. Poor Stevie, always the dreamer. You will not be married on Saturday. Because I love you, and I'm going to keep on loving you until I don't love you any longer. And if you marry anybody, it'll be me. Because if you don't marry me, you'll have too many broken legs to marry anybody else. So you can just catch your laundry back on the phone and tell her she's all washed up. So Lucky's brilliant idea of love insurance will pay Steve a million dollars if the marriage with Cynthia doesn't go through. However, Steve's ex-girlfriend, Mickey, played by Peggy Moran, as you heard, isn't going to make getting married to Cynthia very easy. Along with the fact that Cynthia's annoying Aunt Kitty is an astrological and numerical nut. What Steve doesn't know is that Lucky's father is the owner of the insurance company that Lucky works at. And Lucky's father is incensed that he sold a love insurance policy. Lucky decides he can't rely on his father's insurance company to back the policy, so he gets the owner of a nightclub named Roscoe, played by William Frawley, who you remember from the I Love Lucy show as Fred Mertz, so he agrees to be the underwriter of Steve's love insurance. At the nightclub, we get our introduction to Abbott and Costello. Yeah, 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 what is this? 
Well, look, don't bother me for a while, huh? Yes, sir. Might surprise a lot of folks who think all I can do is run a joint like this if I went in for insurance. Roscoe, you'd blow them over. Is this okay, yeah, boss? What do you got? I don't know. Look, look. Now, let me alone for a minute, will you? Another drink, Mr. Roscoe? No, no. If I want a drink, I'll call you. Now, let me alone. Yes, sir. Kind of crazy, though, to risk a million on Steve Harper getting hitched. Oh, he's really got it bad this time. I've invited them here tonight for you to look them over, sir. Okay, that's great. Now, I'll scrutinize them personally. And if I'm sold, what do I do? All you have to do is sign a little piece of paper. I mean, hey. Now, what's the matter? Why, oh, it's gone, my wallet. Yeah? Oh, say, on the way in, did you pass a kind of a tall guy in a dinner coat? Yeah. Yeah, standing there with him was there a little short, stout guy? Yeah. That's what I thought. It's about time you met up with the boys. Oh. Come on, Costello. Okay, Abbott. Right, wait, wait, get away from there, Costello. What's the matter with you? Why did you do that? Oh, I'm a bad boy. Will you please go away? You've done enough damage for one day. I want to play. You, how much you want to bet? $10. $10? It's a bet. Okay. I'll bet $10. $10 a year. Come over here. That's the idea. Come on. Now Come you're over talking. Here. Come I never on. knew you gambled. Come over here. Now, wait a minute. What are you doing? I'll just make a change. I'll make the change. Keep the money down there. Okay. Ten more. Ten more to you. Ten... Now, look, now, just a minute. Don't steal it. Win it honestly. Put it down there. No, I mean, put it there and leave it there. That's it. Give me that bill. Give me your hand. Put it in my hand like that and leave it there. Try to kid. What are you doing? I want to play. You got any more money? Oh, yeah, I got a lot of money. Let me see. Play it. Let me see it. Well, hundred dollar bills. Get a load of that. High bill. Five hundred dollar bill. High bill. Not a high. Hundreds. Not a high. They're all hundreds. What was that? Somebody put a buck in here. No, behave yourself. I bet ten dollars. Ten dollars? Why, certainly. Now, wait a minute. I had a ten dollar bill here a minute ago. I Have you got two tens for a five? Yeah. There we are. Now, there's your ten. Come on, come on. What's the matter with you? Something wrong? Yeah, $15 went south. What do you mean? You gave me a lot of fast talk. You see, I got two tens for a five and I give it to oh, you. Oh, you did. Wise guy. Okay, here's your five. Give me back my two tens. That's better. Now get out of here. Okay. All right, now you, you want to bet more. ten more to you. That's the idea. How about you, friend? Oh. Hiya, boss. Here's two tens. Give me a five. <laughs> you did it to me. And he did it to me, too. Oh, certainly. What are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing, but whatever I'm doing, I'm doing wrong. Well, here, I'll straighten you out. Here, I'll bet you $200. Okay. Now, take a number. Any number at all from one to ten. Four. No, number five. But you were close. You're getting hot. You're getting hot. Want to make a wager, boss? Why not? The bankroll. The whole works. Now, you take a number. Any number at all from one to ten. Seven. Oh, please. Boss, I'll bet you $500. Now, you take a number from one to ten. Seven. No, number eight. I had eight. They weren't even playing. Now, listen, you mugs, cut out this nonsense and give him back his stuff. You heard the boss. Give the man back his stuff. Is it in there? Yes, this is it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is my wallet. I was mining it for you. Mining it for me. Now listen, you ten-cent thief. No more of this stealing. We've gone legitimate. You heard the boss. No more stealing. We've gone legitimate. But wait a minute. What are you doing with my wallet in there? What's the idea of this? Why do you do things like this? Uh oh. I'm a bad boy. <laughs> so this is really the first time people, outside of seeing Abbott and Costello on the vaudeville circuit, could actually see one of their brilliant routines in person, or at least see their faces, not just their voices. Their timing was just impeccable. And while Costello gets a lot of the laughs, it's Abbott who really sets up everything. And he's equally hilarious in his matter-of-fact tone that he always has. Next, Steve and Cynthia arrive at the club, and Lucky gets to meet Cynthia for the first time. Also, Steve's love insurance policy has been approved and will be underwritten by Roscoe. To complicate things, Mickey arrives at the club. Lucky runs interference and keeps Mickey away temporarily. However, as it turns out, Mickey is a singer and, of course, decides to sing on stage. And here is where all of the early Abbott and Costello films really get bogged down, much like the Marx Brothers movies and the dreadful musical numbers. Now, at least with DVDs, you can fast forward. If you were stuck at the theater way back when... Not so lucky. So this particular number serves a purpose, as Mickey sings a love song and makes eyes at Steve in order to make Cynthia jealous. After the song, Lucky tries to keep Mickey occupied, but Steve ends up in a phone booth by accident with her. Of course, Mickey kisses Steve, and Cynthia just happens to see it before Steve could get away. And Cynthia leaves the club and decides the wedding is off again. 
seeing that his love insurance could go sour, Roscoe decides to put Abbott and Costello on Steve duty to make sure that he really does end up with Cynthia. To get Steve off her mind, Cynthia heads to South America to the fictional town of San Marcos for a vacation, hence the title of the film, One Night in the Tropics. Before Steve leaves, Mickey arrives, and while Steve makes them drinks, she sneaks off and finds his ticket to San Marcos, so she will be following Steve to South America, unbeknownst to him. At the dock, where the large ship will sail, Abbott and Costello and Lucky are waiting for Steve. Lucky tells Abbott and Costello to call Steve's apartment to find out if he's left yet. This ends up being a setup for another Abbott and Costello routine as they pass a taxi that has a ball game playing on the radio. Of course, this gives Abbott and Costello a chance to do their most famous bit of all time, who's on first. And it's a low ground to back up third base. Ball game. Eagle Jumbo oh, has it. That's the throw. And Dizzy Dean is safe at first base. Dizzy Dean on first base. Do you like ball game? I love it. Come here. You know, don't say a word to Roscoe. You know I have a ball team of my own. You have? Sure. But you know what they give these ball players nowadays? Very peculiar names. Funny names. Nicknames, you know, like uh, Dizzy Dean and... His brother Daffy. Daffy Dean. What's the fellow's names on the team? Well, now, let's see. We have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I'm saying who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You know the fellow's names? Well, I should. Well, who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. Who? The first baseman. Who is on first? That's what I want to find out. That's what I'm telling you, man. You got a first baseman? Certainly. Who's playing there? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. Yes, who? On first base. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Have you got a contract with the first baseman? Well, naturally. Who signed the contract? Well, now, you wouldn't expect anybody else to sign it. But who? Yes. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. He does. Yes. Every buck. Every buck. He gets every buck. Mm-hmm. Look, all I'm trying to find out is what is the fellow's name on first base? Oh, now, wait a minute. Let's straighten that out. What is on second I'm base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Oh, he's on third. Now, we're not talking about... How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. I mentioned his name. Yes. If I mentioned the third baseman's name, who did I say is on third? Oh, no. Who's on first? Never mind first. I want to know what's the fellow's name on third base. But what's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third base again. Well, I can't help Let's that. you and I stay on third base. Don't go off. Well, what is it you want to know? Who is playing third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? Now, who am I putting on third base? Yes, but we don't want him there. You don't want who there? No. So what's the guy's name belongs there? What belongs on second? Who belongs on second? Who is on first? I don't know. Third base. Third base. Now I'm back on third base again. Well, I can't help that. You got a pitcher on the team? Naturally. What's the pitcher's name? No, what is on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. Third, Third base. base. Look, I'm a catcher too, you know. What do you mean? I'm a catcher. But well, what about? I'll catch on your team. Go. The heavy hitter gets up. So? He bunts the ball. Me being a good catcher, right? I want to throw the ball to first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you said right. That's the first thing I said right. Mm. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Look, all I want to know is when I pick up the ball, I throw it to first base, who gets it? Right, right, absolutely right. Naturally, if you throw the ball to first base, who is bound to get it? I don't know, first Third base. base! Again, the timing and the wordplay is second to none. And each time they do that particular routine, it's slightly different, which is always fun. Back to the film, Mickey ends up getting Steve drunk in his apartment and he passes out. Abbott and Costello and Roscoe arrive and send the passed out Steve to San Marcos by plane. By Roscoe's instructions, Abbott and Costello are to send Mickey out of town and away from Steve. So Lucky is on the boat with Cynthia in an attempt to smooth talk her back into marrying Steve. (laughs) Okay, so there's about 45 minutes left, and there's a nice twist in the outcome if you do actually want to watch the film. However, I will warn you that there are four more musical numbers. (laughs) But you can fast forward if you wish. But because I'm an awesome podcasting host, here are the remaining Abbott and Costello bits, which of course don't really have anything to do with the plot itself, but a way to showcase the duo. The first one is Peggy Moran, who almost bursts out laughing a few times, but she bites her lip. More and more I feel that this ain't Kansas City. You shouldn't have let her buy the tickets. Don't be so suspicious, boys. I, I just took the longest way around so I could spend more time with you angels. Now be good boys and tell me a joke. Well, I don't know any jokes. I know one. You know what? I wrote it myself. Oh, behave yourself. Brand new story. Nobody ever heard it before. You wrote it? Yeah. And it's brand new? Yeah, she'll like it. You get a kick out of it. Is it funny? Yeah. The only thing is I don't need you to help me. I tell it all by myself. Brand new joke. Yeah, it's all about a whale, a ship, and Jonah. And it's it's brand new. It's funny. Don't worry. She'll laugh. Now, once upon a time, there was a whale. What kind of a whale? And this whale, a plain everyday whale. All right. I don't want to know what kind of whale. What do you think I hang around with him? I don't. I don't. What do you think I do? Belong to a whale gang? 
A whale, that's all. Oh, that's right. the fodder to the sardine. Yeah, that's all right. Now, see, the whale was in the ocean. What ocean? And, uh, what ocean? An ocean. An ocean. A plain, everyday ocean. So, pick out an ocean. What do I care? That's immaterial to me. Uh, okay, the immaterial ocean. Oh, what kind of a story is this? Now, the whale was in the ocean, see, and he was minding his own bitters, but it was following a ship. What ship? And this ship was... What? A ship that swims in the water. You mean a swim ship? Yeah. Now, the whale was following a swim ship, and he... Who ever heard of a swim ship? I don't know. You're telling me. Well, why do you let me tell a story? Stop interrupting me. Keep your mouth shut, Go will you? Go ahead. Now, the ship was following the whale. Be the what? Now I got the ship following the whale. The whale was following the ship. The whale was following the ship because he was hungry. Naturally. Now, uh, Captain Jonah was a captain of a boat, see? And he didn't want the whale to capsize a boat, so he threw the whale over a barrel of apples. What kind of apples? It just... Irksome, him, isn't he? What kind of apple? Apples that grow on a tree. Well, there's all kinds of apples. There's Baldwin apples, there's Frost apples. Crab apples! All right. Excuse me. Now, he threw him over a pile of crab apples, and the whale was still hungry, so then Captain John threw him over a stool. What kind of stool? Who said that? I did. That's in case you ask. Uh. Three-legged camp stool it was, precisely speaking. Now, Captain Jonah, see, after he did that, the whale was still hungry. Then Captain Jonah figured the only way I could save the boat and my passengers is to sacrifice myself. And he did. He threw a beautiful jackknife dive right into the mouth of the whale. Now, the whale ate Captain Jonah, he ate the apples and he ate the stool, and then the whale swam away. Oh, wait a minute, look, how much more of this story have you got to tell? Just another second. Now, what do you keep interrupting all, all, me for? All right, go ahead. Ah, biffle dipple. Here, here, here. Now, you made me say a bad word. Please. I'm sorry. It's all right, go ahead. Now, three years later, they caught that very same whale, they cut him open, and what do you think they found? Now you get ready to laugh. Uh, wait a minute, just one more interruption. Uh, you're not trying to insult this little girl's intelligence by getting away with that old story about the time they caught the whale and they cut him open and there they found Jonah seated on that stool selling those apples three for a nickel, are you? That's, that's not the... No, it couldn't be that story. No, 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 it couldn't be that. I mean, every little schoolboy knows that story. But you go ahead and tell us. Uh, what do they find when they cut the whale open? Come on. What do they find when they cut the... <laughs> now, don't laugh. After all, I enjoy a hearty laugh as well as you do, and if it's funny, we'll both enjoy a hearty laugh. Next is pay. That's enough. A fine mess you got us in. You're fired. All right, then I'm fired. I You're quit. fired. I quit. Go Give ahead. me my money. Give me my money. All right. What money? What money? The money you owe me for my all salary. All right, all right. Don't get excited. I'm supposed to get a dollar a day, you know. I work for you one year. That's 365 days equals 365 hours. Give me that 365 hours, and I'll get out the lab decay. Now, wait a minute. Not so fast. How many hours a day did you work? Eight hours a day. And how many hours are there in a day? Don't try to put anything over on me, will you, Abbott? What do you mean? Look, there's 24 hours in a day, all but February, which has 28. All right, that's right. 24 hours in a day. And you only work eight hours a day? Then you only work a third of each day. Now, a third of uh, 365 is approximately $121. So you actually only have $121 coming to you? Yeah. $121? That's right. Well, give me the $121. Uh, but... You didn't work Sundays, did you? No. No, and there's 52 Sundays in a year. So we'll deduct 52 from 121, leaving uh, $69 coming to you. Well, give me the $69. Uh, but... Watch with the but! Wait a minute, just a minute. You only worked a half a day on Saturday. Am I right? Here it comes. So wait a minute. You only worked a half a day on Saturday. That's all, just half a day. Okay, now there's 52 Saturdays in a year. Now half of 52 is uh, 26. So we'll deduct 26 from 69... Uh, leaving $43 coming to you. You sure that? I'm positive. I mean, I don't want you to cheat yourself. Well, that's mighty thoughtful of you to look out for my interests. I might as well look out for yours. You already killed mine. So give me that $43. Uh, but, <laughs> just a minute, you took a vacation, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks, that's uh, 14 days. Now, a dollar a day, that's $14. So we'll deduct 14 from 43, leaving uh, the sum of $29 coming to you. The sum up. The sum up. If I get some of it, I'll be lucky. Oh, well, now, wait. Give me the $29. But, but now I know it as good as you do. Wait a minute. Just don't get excited. You took time out for lunch, didn't you? Oh, no, Evan. Not that. Please don't take that away from me. Yes. One little hour a day. That's all I took. One hour a day? I didn't eat much. Now, wait a minute. One little bit of hour. That's that big. Right. That's right. One hour a day, 365 days. That's 365 hours. That comes to about 15 days, I take it. You might as well take it. You've been taking everything out. So? 15 from 29 is 14, but now I know it better than you do. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm glad I thought of this. 
Do you know there's 13 holidays in a year that you didn't work? This is going to cost plenty, too. Wait a minute, just a minute. You didn't work those 13 days. No. Well, you had $14 coming to you, so we'll deduct 13 from the 14, leaving the exact sum of $1 coming to you. How do you like that? I'm supposed to get $365, and I wind up with a buck! Oh, gracias, senor. <laughs> this is a fine time to take a nap. And then lastly, hot dog and mustard, and the set had to be cleared during this bit because the crew kept laughing and ruined the takes. Now, wait a minute, Abbott. If I'm going to stay and watch over a girl, I want my old job back. All right, but not for the same money. Okay. All right. What money? You, yeah. The good humor man. No, no, tamales. Hot dogs. And, and those ants, uh, the, those the ants, they're good. Hot dogs. Hey, you, hey. hey. Come here. Come here. What's the matter with you? Here you go. Oh, yeah. Hot dog. Give me a hot dog, too. What time's the floor show starting? Shh, quiet, please, quiet. No floor show, huh? No floor show. Oh, thanks a lot, kid. There you are. There you are, boy. No, I don't eat mustard, kid. Yeah. <laughs> mustard goes with a hot dog. Yeah, well, not with mine. I eat it plain. Mustard was made for the hot dog. Look, I don't care what it's made for. I'm not going to eat it. I don't like it. Oh, well, that's Do I have to eat something I don't like? No, I didn't know that. I mean, after all, I don't want to go around eating something that's going to make me sick. Well, I didn't know Mustard that. Mustard makes me sick. Well, then you shouldn't eat it. I mean, after all, I'm a happy kid. I got a lot to live I for. I know that, Lou. I don't want to walk around the street sick. All right, now, don't if care. If I eat mustard and I walk around the street sick, I can't get a job. What happens to my wife and kids? What do you mean? Yeah, I got a wife and two children. Well, what about it? My kids wind up in the orphan asylum. Oh, behave yourself. You're a fine guy sending my kids to an orphan asylum. Who's sending who where? What are my kids ever do to you? Nothing at all. What right you got to put them away in the orphan asylum? You know what you're after saying? After all, I'm able to support them, children. I'm... You got no right to put them away. Don't get excited. Come on, get my kids out of the orphan asylum. Now, wait a minute. What started all this? Mustard. Well, I mean, it's there if you want it. Well, you can take it away. I don't want it. Listen, what I'm trying to convey to you is that the hot dog and the mustard go together. Let them go together. I don't want to spoil any romance. Oh, talk sense. Oh, cool. I don't like it. So you don't like it. I like Worcestershire here, George. You what? Worcestershire here, George. Worcestershire share shire shosh. You can't even say it. Uh, but you, you don't like mustard. No, I don't care. Give me a reason. Who are you that you shouldn't like mustard? What are you, some big shot or something? Too big a guy to like mustard? What did mustard ever do for me? I'll be here. Why should I throw myself out on account of mustard? Mustard any better than I am? Go on, pick your friends. Who do you want, me or mustard? Now, wait a minute. Go ahead, take mustard. Just That's a minute, just a minute. Do you know where mustard comes from? I know they don't scrape the... it off a of mustard plaster. Certainly not. They manufacture mustard. Do you know they spend millions of dollars every year to put up factories just to manufacture mustard? Do you know those factories employ thousands and thousands of men just to manufacture mustard? Do you know those men take care of thousands of families and homes all on account of mustard? <laughs> and you, just because you don't like mustard, what do you want them to do? Close those factories down and put all those people out of work? Wait a minute. Do you mean to stand there and tell me just because I don't eat mustard, I'm closing down the mustard factories? Now, wait a minute. I... Are you trying to tell me that those thousands of people are making one little jar of mustard just for me? Oh, I'll explain If that. they are, you can tell them not to make any more because I'm not going to eat it. Ah, oh, right, forget it. You can lay them off. Sure. Who am I to support thousands? Oh, why stand here and argue with you? You said it. All right, some fun facts. Abbott and Costello were paid $35,000 for this film. Now, even though it didn't receive great reviews, the film wasn't a bomb, but it also wasn't a huge financial success that Universal had hoped for. And actually, it was the subsequent Abbott and Costello films that really saved Universal from ruin, as they were constant moneymakers. When Real Art Pictures reissued this movie in the late 1940s, some 20 minutes were cut at the expense of the plot in order to give Abbott and Costello proportionally more screen time. Interestingly enough, San Marcos, of course, is a fictional country. It also was a fictional country in the Woody Allen film from 1971, Bananas. All right, I have a special guest, and it's Joseph Staub. Of course, you remember him from the Marx Brother episodes, and he loves them. He also, of course, loves Abbott and Costello. So we discussed this film. Does he like it? Or does he just like the Abbott and Costello parts? Well, we'll find out. And then after that, I have an old-time radio program, one of my favorites, called Nylon Stockings with Lucille Ball back in 1943. and also features Mel Blanc, who portrays his Bugs Bunny character in the film as well. So you'll enjoy that, and I'll be back next week with yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Okay, we're back with Joseph Staub, who is a big fan of Abbott and Costello. And actually, this is the first Abbott and Costello, actually, second Abbott and Costello movie I'm doing. Of course, the first was Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. So welcome back, Joseph Staub. Thanks again for having me, Brian. It's always a pleasure. So I, I know you did a YouTube video. I think it was when you bought the box set for Abbott and Costello. And uh, it's basically all their Universal pictures. Uh, what was the first... Abbott and Costello film you remember seeing, and then when did you finally see One Night in the Tropics? 
Uh, the first one I ever saw was, of course, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. I'm a big Universal Monsters fan. I've, you've had me on before to talk about some mm-hmm. Universal horror movies. Um, that was definitely my first. That's that's the one that you always hear about as like later day as a younger person. That's the one you always kind of hear about at, over their traditional comedy films. You hear about the monster movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I fell in love with that movie. And uh, I was on Amazon one time and the uh, box set was like twenty five dollars yeah. for all of those movies. And I'm like, I, I snatched it up real quick. I went back and I started watching uh, earlier stuff, Buck Privates, Hold That Ghost, um, mm-hmm. some of that, some of their earlier stuff. Really fell in love with Abbott and Costello. I love their their comedy, their timing, the the routines. I love Abbott as a straight man yes. to to lose comedy, and I think that's something that's just as important as Lou being that slapstick funny guy is Abbott as the straight man to him. And yeah. I think that they, they're probably my favorite comedy duo. If, if, if you look between the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, mm-hmm. I, I really do. I think uh, Abbott and Costello would probably be my favorite out of all those. When it comes to this movie, this was one that I was avoiding for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Just because in, in, in seeing people talk about Abbott and Costello, this is a movie that people do not look too fondly on. Sure. I mean, people give it credit for being what introduced Abbott and Costello and what kind of got them their contract at Universal mm-hmm. and basically what ended up saving Universal Pictures. Sure. Um, which is funny because that's what this film was supposed to do. Right. <laughs> they were wanting this film. I don't know why it had. It, it was other than that, other than William Frawley, who was like a bit player who would become known for Fred I Hurt. Love Lucy 10 years later. Right. This film was full of nobodies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Robert Cummings actually made a little bit of a name, but you're right, he yeah. wasn't there yet. Yeah. He wasn't there yet, and I, I, I think it's kind of funny that this was the movie that was meant to save Universal Studios, Yeah, and in the in a weird kind of backwards way, it did. Right, because of Buck Privates. Because of Buck Privates, but yeah. it, it's, it's weird that this is the one that they kind of expected to save the studio when, spoiler alert, this yeah. is an awful film. <laughs> But one thing I want to I want to touch on because you you brought up a great point about Abbott being the straight man. Watching him now, he doesn't get enough credit, but he's actually funnier sometimes than Lou because of what he does. Uh, even though he is supposed to be setting up Lou, he's just so perfect with his timing. He really is, and I think I think that is as you watch more and more Abbott and Costello films, that's the arc that really begins to stick out. I mean, Lou's always funny, and you're always yeah. gonna laugh at Lou. But the more and more you watch these movies, the more you realize how amazing Bud was at what he did. Right. And I mean, you, you see it a lot in this movie as well. And I mean, th- their scenes are by far the best part of this movie. Oh, yeah. And they don't even come on for the first 20 minutes. I mean, no, they're not on for the fair, first 20 minutes. And yeah, to be fair, I mean, we have the we have the luxury of hindsight. So going back then, I mean, no, nobody knew really about Evan Costello except for vaudeville and radio. So mm-hmm. actually, did you ever listen to the radio programs at all? I, I had I've heard clips and I've heard some of the routines okay. done on the radio program, but I never really kind of looked too much into it. Mm hmm. They're definitely oh. worth checking out if you like podcasts, and I love old time radio. So there's some great episodes like Lucille Ball or Bella Lugosi, and so I think you'd really enjoy those. I'll have to check them out. I know I, I do like listening to. I know on um, I'm a big I Love Lucy fan, and on mm-hmm. all the DVD releases, yes. they included episodes of My Favorite Husband. That's right, and I, I've definitely enjoyed listening to a lot of those. So I probably I definitely would enjoy looking. Oh at yeah, I've never really had the had the time to look into it. The one thing you wouldn't like, and this will lead us right into this movie, is uh, <laughs> the musical interludes and all the fun <laughs> stuff that we get. Of, of course, also doing the Marx Brothers movies. Uh, uh, How did you feel about those? Or do I even have to ask? <laughs> I, I got no. I got Vietnam flashbacks, man. I was <laughs> as soon as they started singing, I started crying into my pillow. It was bad. <laughs> oh my god! I, I saw. I saw in the opening credits songs by um, yep. songs by Jerome Kern. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna and be then, downhill from here and that's the andrews sisters for the next like three or four movies exactly yep. that and at, at least that is like at least that you can kind of skip through and it's not sure. like an integral part of the movie the main characters just break out into song here yeah. i'm just like why are you doing this <laughs> oh no no please no <laughs> and at some points i literally after about 
45 minutes, I, I just started skipping to whenever I saw Abbott and Costello on the screen. Sure. It, it it just got to that point, and I I, lo- I I love all their routines. I mean, it's a lot of their stereotypical routines. You get a sure. shortened version of who's on first. You get put it there and leave it there. Right. Uh, you get the uh, the three hundred sixty five dollars thing, and of course you get just get some smaller interactions and just some slapstick. And I think they really really play well off William Frawley. I think that he kind of gets in with it. And I think that uh, it reminds me of uh, one of their later films, one of my favorite Abbott and Costello movies, Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man. Yeah. Uh, he was awesome in that movie, and that's one of my favorite Abbott and Costello movies. So it kind of reminded me of that, and he really had, even this early, had some really good rapport with them. And I think that he kind of got in on the act. And other than them, he was my favorite part of the movie, and it didn't hurt that he was mainly with them most of the time. Sure, sure, and that that makes sense. <laughs> what's interesting about I think a lot of people love the monster movie simply because you know, people love the monsters but they're also they never have musical interludes ever so I, I, I'm trying to remember when they kind of stopped and they maybe realized they didn't need them maybe it was maybe six or seven movies in I, I don't really remember do you it, it was I'm trying to think it I'm trying to remember if hold that I think did hold yeah hold that ghost had some I mm-hmm. think but they were starting to fade a little bit yeah they had they had a little bit, and then by the time you get to stuff like Who Done It, right? Um, they were gone, and I think that would have—that's another one of my favorite ones, and that would have just wrecked that movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but then you—I mean, of course, there's stuff like the naughty '90s where it's part of the plot sure. and stuff. Yeah, and that's fair. Um, but yeah, there's there's first couple Buck Privates in the Navy hold that ghost. They all had the Andrew sisters, and it's. Yep. I, honestly, I'd take the Andrew sisters over just some random singing people, but uh, that's fair. Yeah, exactly. Especially you look at those old Marx Brothers movies, and all of a sudden, just people just start randomly breaking out in the song, and you're like, right. "Why is this happening?" <laughs> Especially like the first one when they're in the hotel, and all of a sudden, all the all the bellhops start dancing, and you're like, right. "Why is this happening?" <laughs> yeah, I don't need this in my life. I don't need um, this in my movie. <laughs> One of the things that I, it never annoyed me, but it was just like as a kid, I was like, why don't they just call him Abbott or Bud Blue? And this is the only film where they actually are Abbott and Costello. Like they, they don't have like a fake name. Did it ever bother you watching the, the later films when they were given, you know, fake names or character names? That is, I mean, I mean, not not too bad because those were the first ones that I saw. So it yeah. was kind of like. I think it works pretty good and stuff like Abbott and Costello, maybe Frankenstein, him shouting chick and chick yeah. and chick. <laughs> yeah. Um, or um, Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. I think it's their middle names in that one. I'm trying to remember. I think it's Freddie and Bud. It, no, it's Bud and Lou. Yeah. It was Bud. It was Bud Alexander and Louis Francis. So it was mm-hmm. kind of you kind of get close. Similar. To yeah. But the only the only two movies theatrically released movies that they are actually no not necessarily credited but called Abbott and Costello is their first and last movies. Yeah, which is very interesting. They it was it. this and Abbott and Costello meet the Mummy. Um, yeah. Because even though they weren't credited, I think they were credited as uh, in because I'll meet the mummy. They were credited as something different. They, I think, in the credits they were something different, but they just called themselves Abbott and Costello in the movie. Right. You get the Hey Abbott. I think it's kind of funny, but like for the rest of their careers, they were other characters. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I'm trying to remember. It wasn't that. See, that's why I most compare them to. Laurel and Hardy, and they were always Stan and Ollie. And yeah. so maybe that's why I was like, well, why don't they just be Bud and Lou? You know, I, I don't know. But I'm that's yeah, I'm glad that I'm, I'm glad that didn't ever bother you. And yeah, I think <laughs> I, I, really I, think, I think just just kind of also being used to stuff like the Marx Brothers where they were characters. Sure, sure. Or stuff like the Three Stooges where they had some character names sometimes. Mm-hmm. Of of those four, Laurel and Hardy is the one that I really never got that into. Okay. Um, so I, I, I never really had that experience where it was always Stan and Ollie. Um, so I, I was kind of used to the ones that did have the made up names more often than not. Mm-hmm. So it, it never really did. It never really did bother me. Right. And they also came from way, way back in film. You know, they were a good 20 years before Abner Costello somewhat because of what they were doing, those short films. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So we'll, we will get into the movie a little bit. Um, uh, <laughs> Do you did you like the love insurance plot or did you think that was dumb, too? It wasn't awful. I mean, I've seen a lot of worse plots for movies, including some Abbott and Costello movies. But it, I think it was lazy more than anything. OK, um, because, I mean, you get Jim and Steve and then you have Cynthia and uh, Mickey. And I think that it's just an ex- it, it's an excuse to get like the the odd couple pairing right by the end of the movie. 
like one of the things that saves it is William Frawley's character just being mm-hmm. so concerned having underwritten the policy and trying to make sure that they get married, eventually coming in at gunpoint and trying to get them to get married. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's what kind of saves the plot a little bit. But like on its head, I think it's just kind of a lazy contrivance to get the two couples that aren't supposed to be together together. And then, then you have the the aunt, and I think she's just an awful character. <laughs> it's just, it's awful. Like she's like she's um, superstitious, and won't, the numbers all added up to a bad number or something like that. And I'm like, oh my god. So suffice to say, this is a recommendation for those that are absolutely uh, Abbott and Costello completists. I would have never bought this on its own. It came in my box set, so mm-hmm. that, that's why I'm reviewing it. And it's the first, so. We're going there. But yeah, we both agree. You go see the monster movies first and then, mm-hmm. you know, some of the other Abbott Costello movies before you watch One Night in the Tropics. I would I mean, I definitely recommend it just to see like the, the like the impetus the of some of their bits. Yeah, because you get to see some early examples like you see an early embryonic version of who's on first. It doesn't have the full routine. Right. They passed um, the car, right? They pa- yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're standing at the car and the limo driver's looking at him. I never got that whole bit. No, that was um, <laughs> it's kind of weird. Yeah. Um, but you and you only get like the names of the of the three basemen. <laughs> so you don't really get the whole bit. But then you you get it's interesting to see where some of their more popular bits came from, because sure, you, you get to put it there and leave it there a lot later. You get who's on first. You get their the, the wacky numbers bit. The one here is the three hundred sixty five dollars. Later, you get the the seven times thirteen is twenty eight. Right. <laughs> um. You, you'd end up with a lot of those kind of wacky math bits, and I think it's it's just kind of interesting to see the early examples of some of those bits. Like some of them would be directly revisited with like who's on first or the put sure. it there and leave it there. Others would kind of inspire bits later on. But I think that's that's the reason you want to watch this movie. That's other than that, this movie has almost nothing to recommend it. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> so thank you for for rewatching it and going through it. But you did find some redeeming values from it, so that's good. Yep. <laughs> thanks again, Joseph. Yep. Thanks again, Brian. Costello program brought to you by Camels, the cigarette that's first in the service. Camels stay fresh because they're packed to go around the world. Listen to the music of Freddie Rich and his orchestra, the songs of Connie Haynes, Billy Gray as Little Matilda, Mel Blanc as the famous Leon Schlesinger cartoon character Bugs Bunny, tonight's guest, Metro Golden Mayor star of the best foot forward, Miss Lucille Ball, and starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Costello, late as usual. Why, what kept you this time? Ah, oh, I was waiting for our new letter carrier, Abbott. Yes? Yeah, and it turned out to be a dame. Boy, did I have trouble with her. And what kind of trouble? She tried to kiss me. Yeah, she kept right on kissing me on the eyes, on the nose, on the chin. Wait a minute. Why didn't she kiss you on the lips? Well, she's new at the post office, and she can't find the right zone. The right zone. <laughs> there you go again, Costello. I can read your mind like a book. All I can see is women, women, and women. Where did you turn the page for? You'll find some girls. Yeah, yeah, girls. <laughs> girls, girls, girls. Every night you're out late with girls. Last night you were out with two. Yeah, but I only caught one. No, 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 no. Boy, no. was she beautiful. I met her down at the Lone Palm. King John is joined. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Was she a gorgeous aircraft worker? She was? What a fuselage. A fuselage. <laughs> That little aircraft worker did something to me, brother. No kidding. I took her in my arms. I felt the pounding in my chest. You mean your heart was beating? No, she forgot to turn off her riveting machine. Uh, <laughs> now, see here, Costello. You'll have to stop this. Either you stop going around with all these girls and talking about them all the time, or we're through. I didn't know you felt that way, Abbott. Yes. All right, I promise. I won't look at another girl if I live to be a thousand years old. Hello, my fat little sugar man. How time flies! <laughs> Gee, honey, you look cute tonight. Do you really think so, honey? Yeah. Now I know what they mean by the solid south. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Costello, look. Don't it, get it, eh? No, all right, look. 
If you're so anxious to go out with girls, why don't you pick out some nice girl like Connie Haynes here? Ah, uh, Connie won't go out with me. Yes, I will, Mr. Costello. I had a fight with my family tonight, and I want to disgrace them. Uh, <laughs> see, what did I tell you, Abbott? There's no use. I'm surprised at you. Did George Washington give up at Valley Forge? He had a tough time. Never mind. Did Paul Revere give up? No, but Paul Revere had a horse he could depend on. Well, well, you've got me. I'd rather have the horse. I are. Uh... Well, Miss Costello, I'll go out with you on one condition. If you all get me a pair of nylon stockings. A pair of nylon stockings? That's a deal. Now, now, don't be silly, Costello. You can't get nylon. Oh, can't. I can get one pair, two pair. I can get a dozen pair of nylon. That OPA hears everything. <laughs> Goodbye, my fat little sugar man. I see you at 8 o'clock tonight with a nylon. Gee, Abbott, I guess I talk too fast. Where am I going to get a pair of nylons? I want to go out with Connie Haynes. Well, why don't you be smart? Be nice to Mrs. Niles. That's right, Costello. My wife has a pair of nylon stockings. Now, wait a minute, Niles. You mean a dame with those ugly legs spends money for stockings? Well, now, what do you expect her to wear? Hip boots. Yeah, hip boots. I heard that remark, Costello. Oh, well, if it isn't Mrs. Niles in the flesh. And I use the word loosely. Oh, you funny, funny man. And I use the word physically. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing wrong with my legs. Why, I was once a ballet dancer. I used to kick my leg way up in the air. Yeah, and on the way down, you'd catch it. Now, <laughs> now, look, why do you fight with Mrs. Niles? Her legs are very attractive. Are you kidding? Ah. She's so bow-legged, every time she runs, she looks like an egg beater. <laughs> Am I insulting you? My legs are perfectly straight, Costello. Look at them. They're just like arrows. Feathers and all. <laughs> Of all the nerve, I'm not an old hen. Oh, no, get back in your coop. Come on, get back in your coop. Stop that. Chit, 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 chit. Now, stop chit. that, I said. Quack, 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 quack. Stop chit. that, I said. Quack, 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 quack. And Kenneth, will you please say something? <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Niles, you come with me. No. Door, door slams. Never oh, mind. No, no, no. Excuse me. Come here, Costello. Well, I was written here. Uh, never mind what's thought. written there. Excuse me. Excuse me. Well, you've driven Mrs. Niles out of the studio again. Oh, pilot to navigator, pilot to navigator, sighted dame, sank same. <laughs> I think that's very funny, but I'm only three and a half years old. <laughs> it's little Matilda. <laughs> Matilda, what are you doing out of school? My teacher sent me home because I kissed a little boy. You kissed a boy? Well, it wasn't exactly a kiss. We were eating the same liquor stick, and I chewed past my head. <laughs> now, look, Matilda, will you please go home? I can't. I'll get lost. Oh, no, you won't. The train stops at every station. Why does it stop at every station, Uncle Louie? Because it's a milk train. Do they have to milk it at every station? Nah. <laughs> How do you like a little kid, three and a half years yeah. old, wants to know if you have to milk a train? Milk a station? train, milk a train. It's impossible. You can't milk a train. Oh, that's silly. How are they going to get a big train to sit on a little stool? Ah! Ah! Now, look, Ma Matilda, please, don't worry, Uncle Louie. He's trying to get a pair of nylon stockings. You can get a pair of nylon stockings from my friend, Betty Grable. How do you know she has nylons? Because that's where I saw her put her money. The Bank of America never had branches like that. <laughs> Wait a minute, Matilda. Uh, maybe you can help Uncle Louie. Do you oh. really know Betty Grable? Yeah. Here's a picture of us on a bicycle. That's me on the handlebars. Mm-hmm. But uh, why have you got such a surprised look on your face? Cold handlebars. Cold handlebars. <laughs> Betty Rich and the orchestra. No love, no nothing.
Enemy artillery still pounds a newly won piece of mountainside. Between the bursts comes a signal car jeep. Two men in the front seat and a roll of telephone wire behind. When the line's strung and they're back safely, they'll take time out for a cigarette. The chances are it's a camel cigarette because camels are first with men in all the services according to actual sales records. That's one reason why camel cigarettes are packed to go around the world. Packed to stay fresh. Cool smoking and slow burning anywhere. Yes, and it's a reason why your store may be temporarily sold out of camel cigarettes. But remember, when you get camels, you always get more flavor. The result of expert blending of costlier tobaccos. Camel's tobacco standard is the same for soldier, for civilian, anywhere in the world. C-A-M-E-L. Yes. Camel cigarettes. They stay fresh because they're packed to go around the world. And now back to Abbott and Costello and their search for nylon stockings. Well, Costello, I guess we came to the right place. Look at that sign. Square deal, Bigel Bottoms, the happy. Oh, so happy store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Costello, what was that? That was Beaglebottom making a cheerful refund. <laughs> oh, boy. I wonder where the hosiery department is. Let's uh, ask this fellow over here. Uh, pardon me, mister. Are you the floor walker? What do you think I am with this carnation on a flower pot? <laughs> After all, I'm not a jerk, you know. Well, you're not trying. <laughs> Costello, don't antagonize the man. He might be able to help you, you know. Oh, I think you got something there, Abbott. Mister, please, mister. I wish you could do something for me. I gotta get a pair of nylons. We haven't any nylons, and stop licking my hand. <laughs> it's no use, Abbott. All right. Forget about the nylons and the date with Connie Haynes. Uh, just a moment, gentlemen. I can give you a tip on a real bargain. Uh, due to a slight oversight in our tailoring department, we have 4,000 pairs... Of three-legged pants. <laughs> three-legged pants? That's great. I'll tell all my three-legged friends. <laughs> but don't tell them all. Remember, only one pair to a customer. <laughs> Come on, Abby, let's get out of here. I'm uh, away from this guy. Wait all here. right, don't get excited. Wait a minute. We'll try the sales girl here. Oh, miss, uh, can you tell us where we might get a pair of nylons? Sorry, I can't help you. You see, I'm in long underwear. <laughs> Itchy, isn't it? Yeah. Stop insulting people. Now, there's only one to get one way to get those nylons, uh, Lou. Listen to me. We'll have to see uh, Mr. Beetlebottom. Personally, we've got to do this. Now, come on. Here's the elevator. Up, 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 up. That's enough, Abbott. Up, That's up, enough, Abbott. up, up, Abbott. up, up. Cut it out. Have you tried baking soda? Uh, uh, look, never mind that. All right, folks. Step lively. Get a move on. Plenty of room on a second layer. Uh, are you going up? Yeah. What's up, Doc? What's cooking, Fatso? Costello, look. It's Bugs Bunny. Hey, Bugs, what are you doing running an elevator? Well, I'm replacing a woman that's essential, Doc. Come on, stop wasting time. Get us up there. Okay, Doc, come on up. <laughs> Go up too fast for your fat show? No, I always wear my pants at half mast. <laughs> Bugs, will you please let us out? Okay, Doc. Eight floor, chewing gum, chocolate bar, sweet cream, butter, T-bone steaks, and other postcards. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm going to murder this rabbit. Oh, no, don't pay any attention to him. Now, we've got to see Mr. Bigglebottom about those nylon stockings. There, there's a secretary. Uh, pardon me, miss. Can we see uh, Mr. Bigglebottom? Okay, did you have an apartment? <laughs> an apartment? No. Then where did you want to see him a bird? I want to see him a bird some nylon stickers. <laughs> Stop talking like that. Hurry up. We'll miss the sale. Here you are, people. Here you are. Nylon stockings. Nylon stockings. Hey, you. You over there. I'll take a pair. For selling. I'm buying. <laughs> I must be from Nancy's. <laughs> hey, Costello, stop pulling around. Look up at that sign there. One pair of nylons goes on sale in less than a minute. Hey, but there's 500 women ahead of me. Oh, what do you care? Go on. Squeeze through. Oh, just a minute, young man. You can't squeeze in here. Okay, babe, let's go outside. Hey, you, watch how you're talking to my mother. 
She's a pistol packer mama. What are you, one of the blanks? Quiet. <laughs> quiet, Costello. Is everybody quiet? Everybody quiet, please. Quiet. We are about to put on sale one pair of nylons. Remember, only one pair. The first one to get to the counter will receive the nylons and free medical attention. <laughs> All right, get ready now. All right, Fatso, you gotta win this race, Doc. Hey, Bugs, what are you doing on my back? I'm your jockey, Doc. How can I run fast with you on my back? Don't worry, I got a whip. <laughs> hey, hey, Fatso, your stirrups are loose. Take your feet out of my garter belt. <laughs> They're off, and they're running at Beagle Bottoms. It was a bumpy start, and Costello broke fast. Rounding the hard way, he's pulling away. At the half, it's Costello cutting through the girdle department. Hey, he's into the back stretch. It's Costello by four, by six, and now a final drive down to home. It's Costello all the way. It's nothing between him and the nylons. He can't lose. He's across the finish line. And ladies and gentlemen, here is the winner, Miss Lucille Ball. <laughs> Hey, what's this gag about Lucia Ball? Come on, you. Give me those stockings. Hey, hey, Costello, take your hands off that girl. It is Lucille Ball. Yes, and you won't get the stockings by wrestling with me. Who wants stockings? <laughs> <laughs> Miss, uh, Miss Ball, I'd like to apologize for this uh, unseemly conduct. I I'm Bud Abbott. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Abbott? You're the organ grinder, aren't you? Yes. I, uh, no, no. <laughs> What makes you think I'm an organ grinder? Well, I thought I recognized that monkey with you. <laughs> now, wait a minute, kid. Costello. Who's the monkey? I mean, after all, I'll, 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 I'll... Uh, Costello. Unfinished speech. Costello. <laughs> Costello. <laughs> Costello, come here. Come here. Shh, quiet. Now, you've got to play up to Miss Ball if you want to get those nylons. Remember, you can catch more flies with sugar than you can with vinegar. Who wants flies? Uh, I ain't got enough points. Wait a minute. Uh, look, Miss Ball, it's very important for Costello to get those nylon stockings. Uh, my cue. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, and you don't need them, Lucille. Who don't need them? Name me two good reasons. What are these two things I'm standing on? Chopped liver? <laughs> Abbott, <laughs> you're Costello, on. just a minute. Look. <laughs> look, you better... You better let me take care of this. You know, Lou, after all, we understand things. Women are putty in my hands. Yeah, but who wants a handful of putty? Ah, <laughs> shut up. I'll have you know that I've got the savoir fair. You ain't even got coffee. I know. Hey, look, Lucille, why, why won't you give me those nylons? Give you the nylons? You've got a lot of nerve. You're nothing but a cheap panhandler. You're not even a man. Oh, yeah? Oh, now there's a great ad lib. <laughs> Look at the sheet, that's all. Read what's on there. Well, I think I'll take these nylons home. So long, slug. See you in the slot machine. Well, you fix things fine, Costello. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to dash right out to Lucille Ball's house. Get those stockings and dash right back. Yes, but uh, what if she's putting them on? Pilot to navigator, cancel that last dash. <laughs> Connie Haynes with a hip tune from Oklahoma. The Surrey with the fringe on top. Chicks and ducks and geese better scurry when I take you out in the Surrey. When I take you out in the Surrey with the fringe on top. Watch that fringe and see how it flutters when I drive them high step and strutters. Know the folks will peek through the shutters and their eyes will pop. The wheels are yellow, the upholstery's brown, the dashboard's genuine leather. Eyes and glass curtains you can roll right down in case there's a change in the weather. Two bright side lights winking and blinking, ain't so fine a rig I'm a thinking. You can keep your rig if you're thinking that I'd care to swap for that shiny little surrey with a fringe on the top. As I ride along, the cows will moo in the clover. The river will ripple out a whispered song and whisper it over and over. Don't you wish we?
we could go on forever? Don't you wish we could go on forever? Don't you wish you could go on forever and we'd never stop? Then we'd never have to hurry and we'd never have to worry in the shiny little surrey where the fringe on the top. I think you'll say that your first pack of Camel cigarettes is the best pack you've ever smoked. But just wait till you try your second. Then you'll see what we mean about more flavor, the result of expert blending of costlier tobaccos. Yes, it's Camel cigarettes extra flavor that helps them to hold up, keep from going flat no matter how many you smoke. Prove that in your T-zone. T for taste and throat. Everybody's own testing ground for Camel's rich extra flavor and smooth extra mildness. And remember, wherever you are, your camels will stay fresh, cool smoking and slow burning, because they're packed to go around the world. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camel cigarettes, first in the service. Well, Costello, here we are at Lucille Ball's house. Now, remember, you've got to make an impression on her to get those nylon stockings. Uh, comb your hair. It is combed, have it? Look, ain't it plastered down nice? Mm, what did you use to uh, plaster it down? Plaster. Plaster? <laughs> plaster. How, come you, how come your hair's so yellow? Mustard plaster. Ma! <laughs> Boy, watch me go to work on that Lucille ball. I'll turn on a charm. Uh, you'd better let me handle it, Costello. She's more of my type. I go for those trim ankles. Uh, you couldn't afford the upkeep on an ankle like that? M why not? That's a very classy joint. Oh, sh <laughs> shut up here. I'll ring the bell. Never mind, don't ring the bell. Can't you read the sign? Maid sleeping. I'll knock. Oh, it's about time you guys got here. You'll find the ladder and saw in the basement. Ladder and saw? Yeah, aren't you fellows from the tree surgeons? I was expecting somebody here to trim my tree trunk. We're only interested in your limbs. <laughs> Look, Miss Ball, I'm afraid you have us confused with somebody else. You met us in the department store, remember? I'm Abbott. And I'm Costello. You must have a poor memory for faces. Yeah, especially for poor faces. <laughs> Listen, what do you guys want here? It's too late for Halloween. It's too early for Groundhog Day. Now, wait a minute. What a... Do I look like a groundhog? No coaching, please. <laughs> Quiet, quiet, Costello. Get away from here. Uh, I'll take care of this. Uh, Miss Ball, we're just trying to be neighborly. You know how the laundry situation is, and we're here to help you with your washing. Uh, for instance, we, we wash stockings. And... Yeah, yeah, stockings. Yes. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Is your laundry service fast? Fast. We bring it back before it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Miss Ball, we're especially expert in the care of nylon stockings. Yeah, nylons. Nylons. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you fellas trying to talk me into something? No, we're trying to talk you out of something. <laughs> well, I'm not interested. You'll have to leave now. Hey, Abbott, I think we're sunk. What am I going to do? Turn on the charm. Go ahead. Make love to her. Okay. Oh, Lucille, please don't send me away. I've always admired you. Come, sit with me on this love sheet, baby. <laughs> please, baby. And put your feet, or your face, your foot, now. in my hands. What's happening in my hands? Yeah, now turn it on, Costello. Turn it on. Go ahead. Lucille, I've lived for this moment. We were meant for each other. I was born to kneel at your feet. Get this G.I. haircut with a civilian approach. <laughs> Don't spur me, Lucille. Did everybody go out? <laughs> Don't spur me, Lucille. I love you. <laughs> I love you, Lucille. I love you. I adore you. When I look at your face, it sets my brain on fire. I thought I smelled punk burning. <laughs> hey, Abbott, what should I say? Recite poetry to Recite her. Recite poetry? Yeah. Okay. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. If I don't get you... Tommy Manville must. <laughs> Just a second. Who do you think you are, Santa Claus? No, why? Then stay away from my stocking. What are you trying to do, fat boy? Fat boy? Who's fat? Look at my shape, Lucille. Of course, I go in here, then I go out there, and I go in here a little, and then I go out there a little more than I go in here a little. <laughs> And that's funny, I don't come back in again. 
Oh, stop being silly, Costello. Everybody knows you're fat. Sure, I was talking to your tailor at Universal. He says he measured you for two days before he even met you. Costello. <laughs> He's right, Uneasy Costello. Luck. Hey, kid. Look, Lou, why don't you stop all this nonsense? The best thing to do is put your cards on the table. Come on. Okay, Abbott. It's this way, Lucille. I promised a pair of nylon stockings to a girl. And if you give me your nylons, I'll let you work in my next picture. Threatening me will get you nowhere. <laughs> oh, we could do a terrific love scene. <laughs> Come here, Lucille. I'll show you the kiss. I'm getting the hiccups. The kiss that made me famous. Ready? Ready. Contact. Wow, where did you learn to kiss like that? Siphoning gas out of cars. <laughs> well, what do you say, Lucille? How about another kiss? No, thanks. I'd rather give you the stocking. You fellas turn your backs and I'll take them off. Come on, Costello, turn around. Yeah, and no rubber necking. Don't worry. I won't rubber. Ball. <laughs> I thought it was funny! <laughs> you're just the type that would rubber, heel. <laughs> well, I hope you're happy, Costello. You finally got those nylons. Now let's go. Come in. Hello, Lucille, darling. I just came over to... Why, my fat little sugar man, what are you all doing here two-timing on me? You all are a kid, sir. I never want to see you again. What do you say to that? Well, shut my mouth. <laughs> Abbott, she did. It serves you right. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? I mean, after all, look, Connie, why do you treat me this way? Look, I got to get you the... I, I got you the nylon stockings. Why, sure enough, honey. Bless your fat little heart. <laughs> well, why did you all... Uh, why didn't you have them wrapped as a gift? Wrapped as a gift? I thought you were going to wear them. Shucks, no. I'm giving them to Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball? Wait a minute. Then who have I got a date with tonight? Not with me, sugar. And not with me, shorty. That's all. Nobody wants me. The world's against me. Ah, uh, don't talk like that, Lou. I'm your pal. My arms are around you. How do you feel? I still feel lonesome. <laughs> then rest your head on my shoulder, Lou. Okay, Abbott. Now, how do you feel? Much better. Let's dance. Get out of here! <laughs> Abbott and Costello will be back in just a moment. Again, we send our thanks to the Yanks of the Week, Americans who have distinguished themselves for heroism in the battle area. Tonight, we salute Marine Private John Elza of Wyatt, West Virginia, who stowed away in one of the landing ships that stormed the Bougainville Beach. In the midst of 18 Japanese pillboxes, he started hurling hand grenades, accounted for six Japanese soldiers and aided his adopted unit in taking 16 of the 18 pillboxes. In your honor, Private Elza, the makers of camels are sending to Marines in the Pacific 300,000 camel cigarettes. Each of the four camel radio shows honors a Yank of the Week, sends 300,000 camels overseas, a total of more than a million camels sent free each week. The traveling camel caravans have thanked nearly three and a half million Yanks in this country with free shows and free camels. And friends, be sure to listen to the four camel radio shows each week. Friday night. Laugh with Jimmy Durante and Carrie Moore tomorrow night over another network. Saturday night. Bob Hawk in the comedy quiz, Thanks to the Yanks. Monday night. Monday nights, it's Blondie. Thursday night. And of course, Thursday night, it's Abbott and Costello with their guests next week, Jane Wyman. And here's a message of special importance to our women listeners. Today and every day, our sailors are leaving shore posts to help take our ships into action. As rapidly as they go, their stations are filled by waves. Every girl who wants to serve her country will find life in the waves active and interesting. And because the service pays all her living expenses, she will, in most cases, earn as much or more money as on her present job. Apply to your nearest Navy recruiting station or write to Waves, Washington 25, D.C., for the free booklet, The Story of You in Navy Blue, Describing Life in the Waves. And now here's Abbott.
Abbott and Costello with the final word. Thanks, Ken. Well, folks, next Thursday is Thanksgiving, and Jane Wyman will be here to help us celebrate. And be sure to tune in, everybody. We won't have a turkey, but that Jane Wyman. What a chicken! Woo! Good night, folks. Good night. Good night, everybody at the Lone Pond. Tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show. And remember, Camel cigarettes are packed to go around the world. They stay fresh, cool smoking, and slow burning because camels are packed to go around the world. This is Ken Niles wishing you all a very pleasant good night from Hollywood. More pipes smoke Prince Albert. Make your pipe one more pipe and you'll find out why more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco in the whole world. Open up a big red two-ounce package of P.A. Pack your pipe full and enjoy that rich, nut-sweet flavor. Notice how easy Prince Albert is on your tongue because it's no-bite treated. And see how it packs and burns and draws just right because Prince Albert's crimp cut. Yes, sir, more pipes smoke Prince Albert because P.A.'s got pipe appeal. It's the National Joy Smoke. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. If you are ever in the San Francisco Bay Area and still love collecting or renting DVDs or VHS tapes, come check out Captain Video and San Mateo at 2837 South El Camino Real. Captain Video is open six days a week and closed on Wednesday and one of the last traditional video stores still running in the United States. New movies you can rent for $2.99 a day. Old movies you can rent for $2.99 for five days. And if renting isn't your thing, you can also purchase anything you find in the store. Be sure to tell Ira that you heard about Captain Video from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. Happy renting and happy collecting at Captain, at Captain Video. 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 Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.